Hi, uh, I'm Kathy Albain, Professor of Medicine at Loyola University Chicago Stritch School of Medicine uh, in the Cardinal Bernadine Cancer Center where I direct the breast and thoracic oncology programs. And joining me on Key Insights today is Dr. Eric P. Weiner from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute where he leads the breast program there and is also Professor of Medicine and Director of the SPORE program. And we're delighted to have a chance to speak to you with you uh, about uh, the exciting developments in breast cancer as highlighted in our meeting, the 14th annual Best of San Antonio Bench to Bedside, which just completed here in Chicago at the Sheraton Hotel. And uh, without further ado, Eric, welcome. And it's great to be chatting with you after a, a full day of meeting, but uh, I think exciting speakers. Uh, outstanding faculty that come to speak on all aspects. We've had um, uh, talks ranging from uh, novel therapeutics, two of them actually this year, a lot going on in that arena, translational science, uh, local therapies, adjuvant, neoadjuvant, and in particular your outstanding wrap-up uh, lecture on, on the key messages that you imparted to the audience in San Antonio during your prestigious McGuire lecture and also your thoughts on the highlights of the year both at San Antonio and beyond. So let's let's start with the McGuire lecture. Congratulations oh, again. Thanks. I'm honored to, to know you as a McGuire lecturer and see how wonderful your career has been over the years and, and the award for the audience listening in who may not realize this, it's the most prestigious award in breast cancer internationally that someone can get, sh short of the Nobel Prize, I guess. And yeah, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think there's quite a distance there. <laughs> but anyway, why, you, had a, you had a great approach to your talk about the three targets for the future. You want to tell uh, the sure, audience a little bit a little about bit. that? So when I think about breast cancer, I think we've made a great deal of progress over the last 25 years. I think that from a quality of life standpoint, having breast cancer today is ever so different than it was in, in let's say, 1990, 27 years ago. Um, I think our understanding of breast cancer is, is much more comprehensive. We didn't talk about subtypes of breast cancer back then. We just said, it's breast cancer. Words like triple negative, HER2 positive, luminal A, luminal B, they just weren't there. And I think as a result of the work that has led to the development of, of subtypes, we've been able to individualize therapy and our therapies better. And as a result, fewer women suffer and fewer women die from breast cancer. But there are still 250,000 cases in the U.S. each year. There's still 1.7 million cases worldwide. And in the U.S. alone, 40,000 women die from breast cancer. So we have to do better. And You alluded to the suffering of breast cancer. I thought that was a especially poignant part there. Yeah, so, you know, I'm struck. Maybe it's the advancing age. But I'm struck by the fact that it's still pretty hard to have a diagnosis of breast cancer, and even more than that, to have a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer. And both during the course of a woman's illness and in the last six to 12 months of her life, I just um, am impressed by how much suffering there is that we're not able to get our, our hands around. You know, and... Um, and I think that you know the easiest way to eliminate that is to come up with better treatments and to prevent death. So talk about those three targets then that you you so focused on. So one of them isn't so much about preventing death, but doing something that's just the right thing to do. But the the three things that I talked about in San Antonio that I think are sort of the three pillars that we have to pay attention to um, are one drug resistance. If a woman dies from breast cancer um, and she's someone who has been able to get treatment, then the reason that, that unfortunately she loses her life to breast cancer is because her cancer ultimately becomes resistant to drugs. 
So therapeutic resistance, whether that's for patients with HER2 positive disease or triple negative disease or, or luminal B disease, is, is critical. We have to understand why cancer cells that may often initially be sensitive to drugs develop resistance mechanisms. And, you know, as our colleague George Sledge often says, um, let's see if I can get this right, um, one, one cancer cell is a whole lot smarter than uh, 100 medical oncologists. And the, the, the cancer cells figure out how to get around the treatments we have. And we need to get better at that. And in some situations, we've made progress. And we've, we've gotten around therapeutic resistance by the development of new drugs. And others were beginning to understand mechanisms. Um, but that's an area where I think that with all that's gone on in the basic and translational science around breast cancer, that we have tremendous potential. Agree. So I'm actually going to jump to the third because okay. I think that that also affects mortality. And that is a huge problem, and it's the problem of health equities. And we know that basically anything that makes a woman a little different from the typical 50-year-old, white, middle-class, reasonably well-educated woman with health insurance puts her at risk for doing more poorly from her cancer. Right. Women who don't have insurance, women who don't have education, women who lack social support, who are of color, I can, the list goes multiple on and on. Multiple comorbidities. Multiple, multiple comorbidities, um, gender preference, support. all of these things. And of course, the one we focus on the most, or the two we focus on the most in the U.S., are poverty and, and race, both of which are just huge. And they become even bigger when the cost of cancer care gets more and more expensive. When there isn't any good care, it almost doesn't matter if you can afford it or not because it's not any good. But when you have great care, if you can't afford it, it, it's that much more of a crime. And somehow in this complicated country we live in, and beyond this country, around the world, we have to figure out a way to deliver the treatments that we have to people. And that's part one. And then part two is we have to help people accept those treatments. Because we also know that it's not just about having insurance and having availability because some people don't take advantage of it. And we have to understand that better. So I, that, that, those are the, the two that affect mortality. And the third major target in my mind is over-treatment. When people talk about mammography, and this is of course a huge controversy, they talk about over-diagnosis. I'm focusing on over-treatment right. for the cancers that are fundamentally pretty well behaved and have a very low potential to threaten someone's life. And we don't typically cause death as a result of overtreatment, or theoretically we can if people develop complications, but we do cause a huge amount of morbidity. Morbidity from chemotherapy and excess surgery and radiation and every even hormonal therapy. And so we have to begin to peel back the treatment. And I think it's going to be a stepwise process because everybody wants to be very careful here. Nobody wants to deprive a woman of treatment that could be life-saving if they're not pretty darn confident that, that the approach is going to be successful. But we have to start with groups of patients who have both early stage disease and biologically favorable disease and ask questions about how little we can do to give them the same outcome. Well, thank you so much for that. And um, those of you, by the way, who want can go to the San Antonio website, sabcs.org, and watch his entire McGuire lecture and hear all the jokes and all the other anecdotes along the way that went with an outstanding talk. So again, congratulations. But let's move Thanks. to the meeting. Um, that we just finished uh, and consider I think your view and as it turns out your view and my view were pretty much in sync on what the highlights were 
of the year, the San Antonio meeting and some ASCO and ESMO and ACR thrown in. But you talked about over-treatment, too much treatment, and I think one of the biggest controversies right now is extended adjuvant therapy. And let's start with that one and we can move through the others. Well, I think you and I agree about this. And so the extended adjuvant therapy, which has been talked about now for 10 years, really, ever since uh, MA17 first came out, giving five years of an AI after five years of tamoxifen, which, of course, was quite beneficial. The question has been, how long do you continue an AI? And we had the results of MA17R, which looked at five versus 10 years of an, M of an AI at ASCO this past year and then published. And that showed pretty clearly that there was a benefit, but that it was a very, very small benefit, right. especially when we're talking about distant recurrence. And there's a downside. Okay. Um, and I think what we got from San Antonio is... So what, three, three new trials were presented? Three right? new trials, none of which met the criteria that had been laid out for statistical significance, showing superiority right. of, lo of longer duration therapy, but all of which showing some hint in that direction, or certainly two out of the three. Um, but what we found was that the benefits are really limited. And I don't know about you, but I don't find this that surprising. You give a drug for five years, the end of five years, you probably have gotten a lot of the benefit out of it. Yeah, so we know that um, endocrine response of breast cancer can relapse with a hazard ratio that's pretty constant for 20 to 30 years. And that disease that's still there may already be resistant to what you're giving. So the tools that are now being marketed for predicting well, first for prognosing who is at low risk for late, and I think that's a pretty good. A lot of those tools do that. But if they're at high risk for late recurrence, then everyone is jumping into, let's give more extended therapy. And we just have one case control study with ME17 with one of the tools. Uh, but what do you think about all of that? Are you, are you using them in your practice regularly to make your decisions? So the way we as a group approach this issue of continuing an AI. And, and I will say that the vast majority of postmenopausal women who we take care of get an AI at some point along the right. way. And I think that's key. We do that. Yes. We sometimes start with an AI. We still often start with two to three years of right. tamoxifen and then follow with an AI. But data but, supports some AI, yes, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. And everybody, yes. But the decision to continue beyond five years for us really comes back to clinical characteristics of the cancer initially. So in somebody who had stage three disease initially, maybe some patients who had stage two disease were more inclined because those patients are at higher risk, not only for early recurrence, but for late recurrence of ER positive breast cancer. Um, so at least at this point in time, we don't use any of the genomic tools, whether it's um, the BCI or Oncotype DX or any of these other tools to make decisions about late recurrence. We use those tools to make decisions about chemotherapy and prognosis early on, but we haven't started to use them to influence our decision about um, what we're doing in, in, in terms of uh, extended therapy. I do think, though, that these three new, new trials that were reported that now have good biorepositories on are going to allow us to look at all these tools prospectively on prediction of benefit to extended. Yep. And when we have that, we'll be in better shape. I mean, my own hunch is that we will continue to ask questions about extended therapy, but there are going to be questions where, if anything, the control arm will either be a placebo or an AI, and I don't think they're that different because I don't think the AI is so effective. And we'll be looking at new approaches, new approaches like some of the, once they're developed a little bit more, the selective estrogen receptor degraders. Yes. And then there's all the other um, areas to focus on targets all the way to the stem cell and should you introduce some of the targeted therapies for other pathways late as opposed to just continuing an Absolutely. AI? And those studies need to be done. Well, go on to your next uh, highlight uh, for the year. What's another area? Well, so I think it, it, this is actually 
the flip side. This is where you can't back off on okay. therapy, and that's with chemotherapy for triple negative breast cancer, yeah. for example. Mm -hmm. And it's not just triple negative breast cancer, but let's focus on triple yeah. negative breast cancer. And where we had the trial uh, presented earlier this year comparing six cycles of TC, docetaxel, and cyclophosphamide versus um, a, a regimen that included uh, an anthracycline plus cyclophosphamide and, and typically paclitaxel. And where I thought it was pretty clear that the message was that you just can't give TC alone and expect the same results um, if you have a patient particularly who has no positive right. triple negative disease. That's not the time to be sparing the patient the chemotherapy. And what did you make of the, the Danish study with the, the TOPO2 uh, normals doing the same with TC, again, times six, not times four? Yeah, you know, I, I that found that... That story has ro I, rolled it, along, it, hasn't it? It has, and I found <laughs> it, a, you know, it, it, of course, is what they might have predicted in advance based on what people think about TOPO2. But I, I just wouldn't put Not too ready much for stock into it yet. Type. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, how about the CDK4-6 inhibitors? They have made a lot of press at San Antonio yeah, and so in Ismo. I think the CDK4-6 inhibitors, even though they have yet to show a survival advantage, are here and here to stay. Yeah. I think the benefits in both the first and second line metastatic setting are pretty dramatic from a progression-free survival standpoint. They're not terribly toxic, other than to the wallet. They are expensive drugs. Um, but they aren't terribly toxic. Um, most people tolerate them quite well. And my sense is that the right study will show a survival benefit. Yeah. They're now being looked at in the, in the post-neoadjuvant right. and in the adjuvant setting. And I think these are important drugs, and we've seen very, very consistent results um, between palbocyclib and ribocyclib. Abemocyclib, which is the, well, the, the one drug that's a little different. A little different. Little different. Yeah, I know. Abema is a different drug. It has a different toxicity profile, and it's the one drug that really seems to work as a single agent. Yeah. So I think that drug will go someplace as well. And, you know, I had mentioned this earlier, but it looks like these drugs are going to play a role in HER2 positive breast cancer as well. What isn't entirely clear is whether it'll be the same role in ER positive HER2 positive breast cancer and ER negative HER2 positive breast cancer. But I think, I think we're going to see a lot of these drugs. Your thoughts on capecitabine? No new data, but uh, a change in a big trial that's been running. Do you want to comment about that? Yeah, so CREATEX, uh, people probably know, is the study that was done in Asia that looked at giving capecitabine to women with both ER negative and ER positive breast cancer who had um, residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy with an anthracycline and a taxane. And it showed an improvement in both disease-free and overall survival, but a much bigger improvement, much to the surprise of, I think, all of us in the triple negative patients. I personally have only used it a couple of times in that setting. I'm looking forward to seeing the data published and being able to work it through a little bit more. Um, and there's a part of me that just wonders if another study were done, would it look quite that good? Because it looks so good. Um, and yet, typically we haven't thought of capecitabine as a drug that's so incredibly effective for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So I don't know what to make of it, but what has happened is that ECOG Akron was running a study in triple negative breast cancer, residual disease um, after neoadjuvant therapy, randomizing to no further chemotherapy or to a platinum. And they now have changed the study so that capecitabine is the control arm. And I don't think they had much choice, yeah. but it pains me a little bit to think that um, the assumption is that all of those women will get capecitabine. Because the way they gave the capecitabine in the trial, and, and as you pointed out earlier, most people didn't get it quite right. that way, um, but was eight cycles at full doses. 
and that's a lot of capecitabine, particularly after you've had a lot of chemotherapy. Well, one last in the area of survivorship research. I, I think there was a lot at the meeting, but uh, what was your favorite one? So I, I, I don't know that this quite fits into survivorship, but um, well, I, sure think it it's, I think I, it's... If you, I know what you're going to say, I think. I, I think it's scalp cooling. Right, right. And hair loss is a big deal for people. That's a um, It's a big deal for women with breast cancer. There are a lot of people who desperately don't want to lose their hair, some people who don't go through therapies that maybe they should because of hair loss. And there are these new systems to cool the scalp and not totally eliminate hair loss, but it brings way down the rate of, of significant alopecia. I, I'm impressed by the results from these studies. I think they're quite consistent with one another. And I think the big challenge for all of us is to figure out how to make this work for patients because insurance doesn't pay for it. So for someone who doesn't have the financial resources, it's a problem. And then the other piece is how to make it work logistically in our clinics right. because it involves staying for more time than would be the usual and taking up space and having your head cooled. And we got to figure this out. I will tell you that, that logistically for us, it's a real challenge. But we're committed to trying to sort it through and make it work. Well, Eric, thanks so much. It's been great thanks. chatting with you thank and for you. coming. And I want to thank the audience for uh, being with us for this uh, chat and um, listening to Key Insights. Hope you'll think about coming next year to the 15th Best of San Antonio Bench to Bedside.